red. Beside the gravel driveway are a grove of trees. My husband has hung four red dresses. I watched them sway and dance, sleeves uplifted in the branches. Red, Valentine's, anniversaries, birthdays, Christmas. Red lipstick, nail polish, shoes, dresses, purses, accessories matched for love. My father butchering deer, rabbit, duck, beaver, muskrat, moose, elk. Nukum's headkerchief, Nimusum's neck bandana. Smoldering hot embers, smoking dried meat. An infant's birth, blood gushing from the tunnel of life. Its placenta buried in the root of a tree. The red hand paintings on a river's cliffs, caves where people meditated their vision. Four fires tended by the Ustap Ilsak. Four days mourning the truth at reconciliation gatherings, they returned to the hearth. Prayer cloth offerings to the south, where thunder and lightning rip the heavens. Fire bolts racing through the tree, its arms bursting with flames. Red dresses hanging in the Canadian Human Rights Museum, the people's blood coursing through our veins. I think what's really important in this particular poem is that it, it does address the, the missing and murdered Aboriginal woman, right? And uh, red has become associated with uh, that that terrible those terrible things that have happened to our woman. And I'm terribly I feel terrible terrible about that. But um, we come from blood, right? And we return. We uh, our 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 birth canal when a, ch a child is born is filled with uh, blood and um, and and we also come from a very very long history of cave paintings where our ancestors left their story, the pictographs, right? So, yeah, and we also um, when we're talking about uh, survival as Aboriginal women. We have we face so much, and people don't recognize it. And increasingly, as I read about Black women's stories, I see a lot of parallel parallels. It, it's really important to find this balance between what happened to our women and what ha what, what that 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 life giving blood that is still coursing through our veins. We must understand, I think, that um, all all everything and anything that has ever br had a um, breathing apparatus here on earth has left their breath in the wind so they're never ever far from us they are in the wind and that is one of the teachings of our elders those uh, women who have been so mishandled and mistreated and and whose lives ended so prematurely um, they're still with us and we are the grievers of, of um, their uh, disappearance. I know as a young woman, I have put, I put myself in very precarious positions and I could have been one of those women. And uh, I think about that a lot. And so when my daughter was growing up, I had to ensure that she knew the signs of, of how to protect herself, uh, how to, how to, uh, think of danger that was right around the corner. And she hated it. She thought we were double standing because my son was raised uh, differently from her. But we always said to her, women are much more vulnerable and we have to uh, we have to show our confidence so that we don't appear uh, uh, vulnerable and, uh, and show that strength that we as women have. It weighed really heavily on me trying to write this poem and honoring all of those um, disappearances and thinking of their families and uh, their sisters, their mothers, their aunts. And it really, really weighed heavily because I've had relatives who've been um, murdered by loved ones and uh, it's difficult.
Oh my goodness, uh, what does it mean to be an indigenous poet? Well, you know, I don't think, I don't spend any time thinking about that. I know that it's a gift and I, I received that gift very early in life and I also received it through dreams and it was affirmed by my elders when I went into ceremony for my spiritual name and to honor uh, 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 the, the process of writing. So I... I that's my job is, and, and that's my my um, my destiny, I think, so to speak, is that I am a poet and I don't try to be anything else. I mean, I try to write a novel. I'm not a novelist. I'm not a playwright. I'm a poet. And that is how my muse speaks to me. And I have to honor her. Everything. <laughs> All these questions that have been put forth by various people, uh, the requests that I have received, I've created a lot of new poetry. Um, but I, everything, is, uh, life is poetry. That's all there is to it. How we walk is poetic. How we talk is poetic. The breath of life is poetic. So um, it, it all is. No doubt that it's cathartic. But I, what, I, what I will say, and I've been saying it all along, because I have been in therapy with a psychiatrist early in my growing years and a psychologist, and I did the work. I did, I did, poetry didn't the work for me. It never did. And I can tell you right now, I've known a lot of other writers who are still alcoholics and who are have depression or whatever, and their writing hasn't cured them. You, the personal person who has these problems, you do the work, not the writing. What the writing will do is perhaps show you patterns of behavior. Then you have the capacity to change that behavior if you're astute and recognize uh, those patterns on a written word. That's what yeah, there's no, you know, it's like vomiting all over the page, really, essentially, that's catharsisism. And then smearing that vomit like it becomes organic, it goes ret return to the earth. And what happens is that then the, a seed will fly out out of that catharsisism as you write. One of the things that I did because residential school messed me up in terms of uh, um, my self-respect, my sexuality, my personhood. And it, it, I didn't learn any of that stuff in a healthy way back when I was growing up. So what I did with my daughter is was when she was growing up, we celebrated all of her little growing, maturing body. And I took her into ceremony with my elders and with her best friends, all women, when she was a young, uh, when she was young, and then she was going into her moon time. And what the elders did was wash her hair and braid her and braided her hair in sage and sweet grass, and they put ribbons in her hair, and they put um, a shawl. And I'm giving this away as a teaching for anybody to use. Uh, and they put a shawl on her that was over a hundred years that belonged to my grandmother. It's over, a, I still have that shawl, it's over a hundred years ago. And she had to give up all of her toys that she grew up with to everybody. She gave those up and all the women that were sitting in a circle gave her spiritual teachings about womanhood or whatever, how she can encounter and answer herself as a young woman. And I wish to this day she had written it. And I, did, I wasn't um, on top of it enough to uh, encourage her to write it because we can't remember everything. And then we had a berry ceremony. We put all the berries we could think of on a big platter. She shared that with us and she ate that. She had to give up berries in every shape or form for one year. Okay, one year. And then at the end of that year, we brought her back into ceremony when it was full moon time and gave her a platter of berries. In that process, she taught my husband and I, my family, a lot about self-discipline, 
perseverance, self-respect, all of those things. She's now 40 years old, so she's come a long way. So that is a very ceremony for the moon, for for entering the moon place. Uh, even if you're 20 and you've had your moon and you want to go back and reclaim that part, ask family to witness it and to carry it out with you. It's never too late. The other that we do for a young woman and uh, is another ceremony, and I mentioned it in the poem, is the placenta ceremony. And I won't give that one away because there's a whole spiritual connection to it, but it is buried at the root of a tree, on, in, in the root of a tree. And when I talk about uh, fire bolts racing through the tree, its arms bursting with flames, Think of the tree, uh, it's a living entity. It gives it life, it breathes its medicine. That tree is a woman in prayer all the time. And, and, and if you think about the people talking about uh, gene, uh, genealogy or our family tree, that's what it is, is that all of, the, all of those families that uh, arms stretching out all over the place. And so that those are my, my, my wishes that I, I wish that I had when I was growing up and I never had that. And um, now the other thing I am exploring is menopause. How do we talk about menopause? Now I'm way over, I'm way over menopausal time. So I, I mean, I'm in my late sixties, but I, I, I want to approach my elders and I've been talking about it for a long time is, is there a ceremony to honor menopause? I know my own symptoms and I can share those, but those are something we need to talk openly to our, our young women as well.